Get ready for a whole new experience at this year's Festival of Homiletics in person and online, May 16th to 20th. Join us in Denver, Colorado, or online from wherever you are. This year's theme is After the Storm, Preaching and Trauma. And it will feature Otis Moss III, Nadia Boltz Weber, Robert Wright, and Raphael Warnock. This year, the festival will draw up to 1,200 colleagues in person and thousands more online for preaching, worship, and dialogue to help you develop a hands-on way to engage trauma in your own ministry context. Other speakers include William Barber II, Anna Carter Florence, Lauren Winner, Emily and Amelia Nagoski, and many more. Make plans for this incredible learning experience with top teachers. Join us in Denver or online. Go to www.festivalofhomiletics.com for registration and details. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Matt Skinner. The text for Ash Wednesday, which falls on March 2nd, 2022, this year, but they're always the text for Ash Wednesday. So the fact that it's March 2nd, 2022 is that's when Ash Wednesday is. The texts are, and always have been, and probably always will be, Isaiah 58, 1 through 12. The Psalm is 51, 1 through 17. 2 Corinthians 5, 20b through 6, 10, and the gospel reading is from Matthew, chapter 6, 1 through 6, and then 16 through 21. Do we detect a little exasperation about the choice of texts? Well, I, uh, I, maybe, (laughs) uh, but... (laughs) I wonder if it's comforting for some people, like hearing the Christmas story on Christmas Eve from Luke 2 or something like that. I don't know. I I don't know. However, this year, this year, because of where we are in our second, you know, we're really coming up on the second anniversary, well, not even anniversary, but second year of the pandemic, when things, you know, really shut down the middle of March. Uh, and I just, and I imagine that there are some preachers out there who don't have a choice in choosing what, uh, what their, what their passage is going to be for Ash Wednesday, but I don't know, this is like one year where I think, what is it that, what is, is there some, is there something about Ash Wednesday this year that you are feeling called to preach on that are perhaps not represented in these texts. However, we will talk about these texts, but I just wanted to put that out there that maybe there is, you know, what is, how is Ash Wednesday resonating? How is it being heard uh, on, in this, uh, as we come up on this second year of, of the beginning of the pandemic? And I, I'm not, I'm not sure if these are the passages that I would choose or so my dad never my dad never goes to Ash Wednesday because he doesn't like to be reminded of his mortality uh and and he and he doesn't like he's a you know retired Lutheran pastor but he doesn't like the whole dust thing uh, so but ma- there might be a lot Is of that people because out there who that's don't what like Catholics the dust thing. do no, that- he just doesn't like it. He doesn't, it, the, it's just been always been a liturgical moment uh, that he has, uh, uh, yeah, just disliked. I think it's the, you know, the, the reminder of mortality, but I, to wonder extent, uh, to what extent, and he's on his like 27th life. It's, he's amazing. Um, but, uh, but I wonder how that is going to be heard this year um, that because there's, there's always death around us. We always are reminded of our mortality in different ways and, and different forms. But uh, you can't, I don't think that going into Ash Wednesday this year and knowing that there are over 800,000 you know, deaths and there'll be more by the time we get there, uh, the mortality is so acute is what I'm trying to say that it just gives me pause this Ash Wednesday. I, I totally agree that we, the last thing we need is one more reminder of our mortality. 
so I mean, given where we stand in the pandemic and and all of the loss, all of the grief. At the same time, I'd say that part of Ash Wednesday is is following where these texts lead. And like you said, the texts are always there. But one of the things that the text, at least this is what stood, stood out to me this year, is the texts have a lot to say about authentic spirituality and authentic practices. And the thing that they take aim at is religion for show, at least especially the Matthew text, especially the Isaiah text. And one of the things that's happened in the last two years is a lot of people have learned, had to learn how to adapt their practices or even kind of nourish, nourish their own spirituality on their own or in smaller groups. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of that has been really interesting and really inspiring in some of the circles I've run in and seeing people who have made it happen when they couldn't go to church or participate in other ways in what we would call organized religion or kind of you know congregationally sanctioned events. And that's been really hard on some. It's not always easy. And people, some people don't want to go back. And of course, uh, others can't wait to go back. But everybody's had to think a bit about, I think, why do I, why do I go to church in the first place? <laughs> um, do I need to be seen when I go to church for it to count in any way, shape, or form? The answer to that is no. I mean, we're in a time now where somebody cannot show up in a congregation for months on end and nobody necessarily worries about them or thinks that like, we just kind of assume somebody's being caught somewhere somehow in the larger web, whether it's digital or face-to-face -face or whatever. I mean, people are in touch, but it's just not, I don't know. I, I've, and so I just find this interesting that, that the Matthew text and the Isaiah text do make me wonder about that, right? Mm -hmm. These are texts written to religious people or addressed, I think, to religious people. And they're saying, don't you dare practice in certain ways if your only goal is X, Y, and Z. And so then you have to ask the question, okay, so what does authentic fasting, prayer, and almsgiving look like according to these texts? Or what does authentic worship look like given how I have to worship now on some Sundays I think that's online? A great, that's a great observation. Yeah. And especially like going into Lent where we will often adopt some practices, you know, practices right. and, but why are we doing them? Is it for the sake of the practice? Uh, that, yeah. yeah, that invitation to reflection, I think is really great. And what do we need from each other to make that happen? So we're not mm -hmm. just all doing this individually. That's not my point, but, and what do we need from a, a congregation and its formal leadership to make that? And of course, I think all of our listeners have had to struggle with this, of feeling underappreciated or trying to pivot every single week to something new. And so, I don't know, I, that's, that's kind of where I settled with this because the villain well, the villain in Matthew and the villain in Isaiah is bad religion, or it's religion for its own sake, or religion for the sake of elevating oneself, or gaining status, or, and things like that. Um, yeah, yeah. I just, I just think we see that now in a new light after mm -hmm. two years. I don't think we have conclusions, but I think we're working them out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this really uh, sparks my imagination of what you both have been saying. It, it seems to me that one way you could go with it, which is we don't need any reminders of our mortality right now. But having been reminded of our mortality, um, what then for the Christian? And uh, first, uh, first Ash Wednesday itself uh, invites us into the very regular practice of confession and forgiveness. Okay, this is the last time we're going to mention this book for a while, Caroline. Got it? Got it. Recent working preacher books, Brent <laughs> Strong, uh, talks about uh, uh, the practice of confession. And one of the interesting things is he grew up, uh, Caroline and I uh, grew up in the Lutheran church, where in those days, every Lutheran worship service started off with the confession and forgiveness. So it's but Brent talked about growing up not in a tradition that did confession and forgiveness in church. And so how important it has become to, for him to do it on a daily basis. Um, so that's the first thing. Uh, having been reminded of our mortality, um, the, the practice of confession and forgiveness is certainly a key to Ash Wednesday. But then if we could jump to the Isaiah reading, um, there's... 
here's some other practices that it might talk about. Um, so um, this points us actually away from the practice of fasting itself uh, and says instead, is not this the fast that I choose to uh, humility and then um, loosing the bonds of injustice, uh, letting the oppressed go free, sharing bread with hungry, um, clothing the naked and so on. And so those are the practices perhaps. Um, and so I grew up uh, with a lot of Catholic friends and I went to a Catholic uh, university. Um, and in those days, uh, mostly what my Catholic friends did was to give up something for Lent. Um, but even starting back in those days, and I think this is much more uh, the norm now, people adding a spiritual practice, whether it's um, adding um, confession, daily confession and forgiveness or adding a time for gratitude during the day or, or um, adding the time uh, to do something positive for one's neighbor. I think that's really become a Lenten practice uh, for a lot of people. And uh, so I guess that's the direction my mind goes uh, about this text today. Well, and I think uh, too, maybe holding both of, uh, both of your comments together here with regard to practice and the meaning of, of the practices in which we engage and adopt, that uh, this is not in the, the pericope, it's skipped in the pericope, but, the, but of course, uh, the Lord's Prayer. And so maybe it's also an invitation to you know, adopt a new practice, but as you were saying also, Matt, that, that to step back and, and look at these practices that we do. Uh, why do why do we do them? What what is the meaning of the Lord's Prayer for you? Uh, what what happens when you pray that? Uh, why do you pray that? Where is there uh, where is there a sense of uh, comfort in it and promise, which which uh, which I certainly hear in the Isaiah passage, right? That the Lord the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong, and you should be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail, which is basically a, a, a reiteration of uh, give us a stay our daily bread, you know, it's, uh, and so uh, maybe it's an invitation to reimagine, rethink these practices as well. And, uh, and, and how is it that they are an embodiment of our identity as children of God? And as well as adding, I'd say also giving things up. And I know giving things up for Lent is trite, but that's not really what I'm thinking because most of our, most of the time we're doing that in terms of self-improvement, I think. But, but people are remarkably willing to do a self-inventory of their life, their life right now. And people are willing to part with a lot of things or commitments or relationships um, than they've been, at least in in my memory, I mean, think about this in talking with family members and, and people in my congregation to make real change. And some of this is professional in terms of jobs. Some of this is in homes and, and downsizing and thinking about moving or mm -hmm. engaging with their neighborhood in different ways. And so that's, that's all done for really good reasons that are psychologically sound and things like that, but to help people think about spiritually what's going on there uh, and how do we do that in ways that are, again, I'll use the word authentic again. That's authentic to our true selves. That's not really what I'm talking about, but authentic to what a life of discipleship is supposed to look like and how Jesus holds that up as utterly opposed to hypocrisy, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's about truth telling, even the Psalm as well, right? There's truth first and then reconciliation or truth first and then forgiveness uh, in that, that maybe this is a time to continue to work at the process of telling the truth about ourselves and what gives life and what does not. And again, I don't want to sound like I'm just doing self-help here, but if the church isn't engaged in these conversations in people's lives, and it'll just, then the church will just get shut out of that because I think people are having those conversations, at least folks I know. I think I'm saying the same thing, but I also want to talk about Second Corinthians at some point in time because it's kind of the odd one out here. Are we ready for that? Sure. I just well, I think if you yeah, want to go to Second Second Corinthians, if if for some reason you're so sick of uh, 
of, of Matthew 6 and Psalm 51 and um, Isaiah 58, my first question is, what's the matter with you? Um, but my second thing is, you know, 2 Corinthians 5, I think you have to tell the larger story here of what's going on in this letter. Uh, you, it's, a, it's a weird um, boundaries in terms of the, how the pericope was, was where it begins, where it ends. But I think you have to ask yourself, why is Paul contending for his credibility uh, to these people? You have to explain a little bit that his, his apostolicity, who I got it out, his, uh, his status as an apostle is in question his authority is one. And so how does he, how does he signal that his faith and his ministry is authentically Christian? And one of the ways he does that is by talking about hardship. Uh, Holly Heron points out some ways in which Paul might not be entirely consistent here, but I think uh, on this day, I would talk about ways in which Paul wants to say that his life and his ministry in particular, which really is his life, mirrors the same kind of death to life movement that he sees in Jesus Christ. Yeah. And that's why he's arguing so hard to be reconciled with the Corinthians. So you have to do a bit of the sketch. You have to, or you have to sketch a bit of the story. You have to tell the background and explain why the stakes are so high here, but also then ask people, what does that mean? How would you argue for the credibility of your own faith? And of course the right answer is, you know, it's all about Jesus, but but how does that get lived out, right? Or how does that get preached in terms of your priorities and in terms of your practices? I don't and know. I would, that's where I would, that's my Ash Wednesday this year, at least. But Well, and I would, uh, I would also point out the point of the commentary on the website by Holly Huron. And I, I think this could be another theme of Ash Wednesday that, that the preacher could pull out and, and drop in, uh, in on second Corinthians, but she talks about the the, the simultaneous comfort and discomfort of Ash Wednesday uh, and, and the way in which that, what you were pointing to earlier, Rolf, of the, of the practice of confession and forgiveness is, uh, is that exact experience, right? The confession is, dis, is discomforting, <laughs> but at the same time, comforting. The forgiveness is, is discomforting and comforting. And so uh, maybe, that's, maybe that's a really important theme for this Ash Wednesday. Uh, and again, what you said, Matt, that the church uh, th and these texts give space this, in this evening or this, this worship experience gives space for that simultaneity that, uh, that we experience daily in our lives. And even, even um, especially uh, in our relationship with God.